the virtual briefing from Austin Public Health, the very final one about the novel coronavirus and the ongoing vaccination process is about to begin now. Again, you're going to hear from Dr. Desmar Walks, who is taking over for the health authority position with Austin Travis County. She is replacing Dr. Mark Escott, whom we've heard from for months now as this pandemic has rolled out in our city. You're also going to hear from Adrian Stirrup, Cassie De Leon, and Janet Pichette. Let's take a listen as this gets underway again, the very last briefing about COVID-19 from Austin Public Health. For the Disease Prevention and Health Promotion Division. With that, we'll start with some opening remarks from our leadership, and then we will hand it off to Fox 7, who will be our poll reporter for this event. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Adrian. Good morning, Matt. Thank you, everyone, for joining us again this morning. Um, I'm happy to announce that Austin Public Health is still on a good track, partnering with the county and other community agencies to make sure as we shift from our mass vaccination strategy that we're really focusing on place based and community pop up clinics so that we can get our entire community equitable access to the vaccine. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Desmar Walks, the new health authority for Austin and Travis County. Dr. Walks. Dr. Walks, it looks like you're muted. Ah, there we go. There we go. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Adrian. Um, I'm pleased to join the APH team as the health authority and medical director for the city of Austin and Travis County. I've been in practice uh, in Bastrop County and served as their local health authority. And I've had the opportunity to work with the APH team throughout the past uh, several months to work to um, decrease the spread of COVID-19 in response to this pandemic. And this team has done an amazing job uh, with the leadership of Dr. Escott and Dr. Hayden and Howard and all of the team members um, in getting us to the point where we are now with a positivity rate of 2.2%, uh, seven day average uh, hospitalization of 12 and, and really doing us an amazing job at vaccinating the members of this community. Um, I look forward to the opportunity to work on issues regarding continuing to vaccinate um, the population, particularly our at-risk communities, um, to work with business and community leaders to fully open up our economy um, and going back to vaccination, getting as many people vaccinated as we can so that we can safely remove our mask in compliance with the recent um, uh, governor's directives. And also to just work to bring APH back to the place where it was before pandemic and allowing um, our staff to go out into the community and do the in-person one-on-one um, public health service that has been the core of the APH um, organization. So again, thank you for this opportunity and um, thank you, Adrian. Good morning, everyone. This is Janet Pichette, Chief Epidemiologist. Uh, I just wanted to mainly talk about, uh, not necessarily talk, but reflect on where we have come over the last year. Um, we come a long ways in a short period of time. At this point in time last year, we were beginning to embark on the very first peak of this disease pandemic. And um, we didn't know what lay ahead of us. And there was a lot of hurdles that we crossed. Uh, a lot of things that happened as far as um, we experienced the second wave, we, you know, implemented masking and sheltering in place and all types of things, but uh, we have come quite a way. And as we get closer to herd immunity and our cases flatten out, I do want to remind the public that those prevention measures that we discussed over the year, washing your hands, wearing a mask, socially distancing, staying home if you're sick, 
those those prevention measures apply to many other uh, communicable diseases and are very effective in reducing disease transmission risks. So, you know, when you are in a situation where you feel under the weather, uh, you may want to employ some of those things. And, you know, again, washing your hands, that, that act alone could probably eliminate many foodborne illnesses and other respiratory illnesses. So people should continue to uh, practice those prevention measures, even with COVID, uh, you know, falling behind us. Um, I also want to remind people that we are, it is, uh, we're in June, it's been rainy and wet outside, and we're embarking on a mosquito season. I would be remiss not to mention this at this point. And for people to remember that in those wet conditions to drain any standing water that you have, make sure that you are using products that are uh, contain DEET or things that are effective uh, against mosquito bites. and. Um, make sure that you are dressing appropriately so that you don't get bit by mosquitoes, uh, but also to, um, to avoid uh, when mosquitoes are out and about, and that's during the dusk and dawn and, and during the day, just throughout the day, depending on if, if it's the uh, mosquito that's prevalent for Zika. But just those prevention measures are gonna reduce your disease transmission risk uh, for mosquito-borne illness. So with that, I'll turn it over to Cassie DeLeon. Hey, Cassie, it looks like you're still muted as well. We will we'll, we'll circle back to, to Cassie. It looks like she's having some technical difficulties. So with that, we'll go ahead and we'll move on to our uh, poll reporter from Fox 7 to go ahead and ask questions on behalf of the media. Good morning. All right, so our first question is from the Austin American State, Statesman. It is for Dr. Walks. So it is, what challenges have you encountered or foresee to have Austin Travis County reach herd immunity? I think that um, the biggest challenge that we're going to have is to um, get people, particularly folks who have had COVID-19 to uh, recognize that they still have the risk of developing COVID-19 after they've recovered. They will have antibodies that are produced as a result of having contracted the illness, but those antibodies will not be as effective um, at fighting off illness that's uh, caused by some of the variants of the um, virus that we've, we're now seeing in the community and the antibodies themselves we feel only last for a 90 day period of time so our big push is going to be to convince and, and educate those in our community who have had COVID-19 that they still should get a vaccination and additionally it's going to be um, talking to the community and educating those that have questions and need more information about the safety of the vaccine and the need for vaccinations so that we can reach herd immunity. Thank you. This next question is from KXAN. Should we expect cases to drop this summer and potentially pick back up in the fall and winter? I can go ahead and answer that. Um, I do hope and I hope that we continue to see a flattening and diminishing of cases in the Austin area. Um, however, uh, we here at Austin Public Health, the epidemiology staff 
are watching very closely, especially this next two week period um, following Memorial Day to see if we see any upticks in cases. Um, there's always the potential that we could see upticks occurring. I think we're very optimistic that people getting vaccine uh, on board uh, and becoming vaccinated will help reduce uh, uh, the transmission risk from COVID-19. Um, but it, again, uh, you know, there's always that possibility. Uh, we tend to also look at uh, what's happening in other communities throughout the country that may have uh, had peaks in cases prior to what we did. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's very important that, again, we watch and as soon as we are aware of anything, we try to notify and inform the public of what uh, upticks we might see. But I, I am fairly optimistic that if we reach the point and we're getting closer to herd immunity, either through natural infection or through vaccination, that we will be in a good space this summer. The next question is from the Austin Chronicle. Is Austin Public Health developing any kind of vaccine incentive program to encourage more residents to get vaccinated? If so, what data is informing the type of incentives chosen? I can start with that one and then um, have my colleague Cass Cassie uh, jump in. So at, at this point in the um, in the fight against COVID, we are using a very intentional focused outreach strategy to make sure that um, our communities of color who have been hardest hit by this disease, but still have the lowest rates of vaccine uptake are not only getting equitable access to vaccine, and that speaks to our place-based and pop-up strategy, but also we are working in a way that um, supports and incentivizes them to get vaccine. And so we are in conversations with our uh, partners at the county, as well as city leadership to see what type of incentives make sense. Um, anecdotally and from information from our community partners, we know that there's still a concern with um, our working community about being able to take time off in order to get a vaccine. And so having conversations with local businesses and community partners to allow their workers to have the flexibility to take time to go and, and get the vaccine. Um, but we will continue to use the vaccine uptake data um, broken down by zip code, um, age, race, and ethnicity to strategize with our community about what incentive, incentives rather and strategies make the most sense. Um, Cassie, do you have anything you want to add to that? It looks like we still don't have your, your audio, Cassie. Nothing like the, the last media Q&A to have technical difficulties. We can go ahead and move on to, to the next question. Sounds good. All right, so the next one is from KOOP Radio. As portions of the population remain unvaccinated and COVID-19 lingers longer and longer, can it mutate into a variant more dangerous for all of us? I'll go ahead and answer that. Uh, you know, like I've said throughout the course of this pandemic, um, viruses don't like to stay comfortable in the host uh, and like to begin to change once bodies, people adapt to that virus, uh, they like to mutate. So um, there's always a piss, uh, uh, possibility that there will be a number of variants that are circulating. Currently, you know, we're following up on uh, a number of variants of concerns and variants of interest uh, as designated by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And so uh, we're trying to closely monitor that and we'll continue to monitor that so that we can, um, uh, you know, try to tamp those uh, outbreaks or clusters or cases uh, down uh, so that we reduce transmission risk in the community. And I agree with you, Janet, and I'd also like to add, and that is why it is so important for us to get 
are people vaccinated um, as soon as they have the ability to get out there and, and get the vaccine um, so that we don't give the virus a chance to mutate. It can't, it doesn't have that opportunity if it doesn't have an opportunity to infect a person. So we need to be vaccinating people as much as we can. The next question comes from CBS Austin. Has APH started to see any clusters of cases now that masking requirements have eased and businesses are increasing capacities? Um, I'll go ahead and answer that as well. So, um, you know, we've always seen clustering of cases in various settings. Although some of those clusters and the outbreaks, uh, whether it be in the nursing homes, whether it be in the school setting or whatnot, have diminished or in businesses and whatnot. Uh, or related to what I call super spreader events, such as weddings or funerals. Um, however, we are continuing to see clusters and much of our, our case investigation and focus now will be focused uh, a lot on cluster investigations and outbreak investigations because those have the greatest potential to get out of control. So um, right now we're seeing, uh, we, we are seeing some continued clusters in school settings. Uh, now that school's out, you know, there's a possibility that people will gather after, um, you know, gather, um, so have social gatherings um, outside of the school setting, or it could be related to athletics and whatnot. Um, but anyhow, you know, our goal is, and, and, and the clusters have mainly been in these settings because many of these people, uh, children, who don't have vaccine on board right now. So, um, you know, we're start, starting to see less or fewer clusters associated with vaccinated individuals, but there still exists a transmission risk for those individuals who are uh, less than uh, 15 years of age in our community. Uh, and we are seeing increases in hospitals, hospitalizations in that population. Um, but, you know, you know, our goal is to make sure that we identify cl clusters early and we are able to, you know, investigate and uh, try to reduce those uh, transmission risks that may result from that outbreak. And this is a sort of a related question uh, from Community Impact. Now that schools aren't permitted by the state to enforce mask mandates and virtual schools options are in question, what is your advice for schools to keep kids and staff safe? I'd like to take that one. Um, APH as stance on that is that we strongly recommend the use of masking, particularly in settings that are indoors um, and there are groups of people who are unvaccinated. Um, washing hands, maintaining social distancing, all the measures that have gotten us to the point where we are now. Um, and then we also agree with CDC guidance that those who are unvax that are vaccinated um, can follow the guide guidance that's been put out for allowing them to not wear masks um, in certain settings. But in the schools, um, as a re we recommend at APH that masks be worn when possible. And I would just like to add in, um, it's an opportunity for us now that um, children ages 12 and up are eligible for vaccine. The best protection is to get your child vaccinated. So there's many options. Um, it is the Pfizer vaccine. So make sure your provider has that vaccine or the provider you're seeking to provide to provide your child with the vaccine. Um, that this is the opportunity to get them fully protected and protecting the rest of your family. So we just wanna encourage that. And there's just so many options available. So as we move into the um, summer season, athletics, I know a lot of children are involved in that in summer camps. If they're at that 12 year old age, they could get vaccinated and you don't have to worry about the potential impact that COVID could have on them because they'd be protected. Next question is from Univision. What are the current efforts to get more members of the Hispanic community vaccinated? As we know, it has been one of the hardest hit by this pandemic. That's a great question. I think we've seen a lot of good success 
um, with working with key advocates from the um, Hispanic and Latinx community within our uh, within our city and, and county um, to help engage and know that they're trusted sources. Yeah, there was a few drops of water, but it passed right by. Well, you know, in two months, everyone will be saying, we need rain. Well, we will. It's when we actually need it. Yeah. It yeah. We don't need it later. All right, madam. No, sir. I'll go, and then I'll turn it over to you for yes. some specifics. Yes, sir. Y'all ready? All right. Hey, greetings, everyone. Lieutenant Colonel Allen West, Chairman of the Republican Party of Texas. We appreciate you all coming out for this little press conference and update. One of the things we want to definitely talk about is an assessment of the 87th legislative session. And I think the most important thing to do is just go right down the line at the legislative priorities that were selected by the body of the state Republican Party last year in their convention. The number one was election integrity, and election integrity passed in the 2020 Republican primary by 98.36% saying yes. And I think it's kind of disappointing that election integrity did not get and is comfortable in the space that they're getting the vaccine in. This next question is for Dr. Walks. What are your immediate recommendations to get Austin and Travis County out of this pandemic? Uh, I think we need to stay the course. Uh, we need to continue to vaccinate uh, people. We need those that have been vaccinated to encourage their friends and family members that vaccines are the, are the way for us to move forward from this and go back to our new normal, open our economy and our schools safely, remove our masks safely. I, I believe that in the interim, we still wash our hands step back, social distance, and wear a mask. Um, and if we continue that course, um, we'll keep our numbers down and maintain um, the this uh, calm that we're seeing right now. Uh, in the next two weeks, we'll tell the tale as to whether or not those things are ongoing without it being a law to do so. And um, you know that people are making the right personal choices being vaccinated and continue, continuing to wear masks in crowded places and wash their hands etc so um, we can do this together we've gotten to this point and if we keep this going we'll we'll be successful There's another question about schools. So now that the statewide mask mandate has been lifted, does APH believe it's safe for kids attending summer school and summer camps? I, I believe that the um, school districts have been an integral part of the success of mitigating this pandemic. Um, they have shown through their leadership, through the contact tracing that they do for cases that come up in their schools um, and their collaboration with APH and the state health services, that they are committed to the safety of our children. Um, we, as I said, recommend um, that people that are unvaccinated wear masks, um, that folks avoid crowds um, and those things are, are, are going to be the, the way that we get through this. Um, so it's going to be, uh, you know, teaching our children that you cover your cough. And, um, and if, if you're not wearing a mask, wash your hands. We're going to make it such that hand washing is a thing that we do in school. And, and, and kids, you know, parents and children not making that choice to not come to school when they're sick. So, I think we've made this a habit now enough that I think people are making those good choices. Um, and I think that it's going to be um, something that continues on, not just for this summer, but in the coming fall. So. And what can we expect um, in, in terms of APH's relationship with local school districts and universities in terms of getting 
more adolescents vaccinated over the summer before the start of the new school year. Yeah, absolutely. Austin Public Health is coordinating with our university partners and our school districts to look at opportunities to offer vaccines. Um, we every year do big promotion for back to school shots. And so those that are eligible in parts of those promotions for Pfizer for COVID vaccine, um, which would be the Pfizer vaccine, we would really want to promote um, that, that vaccine being available for those students. So absolutely, we've already done some uh, messaging to um, in partnership with E3 Alliance to the school districts to think about how we want to promote um, vaccine availability for students, but then also looking at beyond COVID, other vaccine preventable uh, disease vaccines that we need to make sure children get before they hit school next year. So it is really important that children get the COVID vaccine who are eligible, but it's also really important that children get um, stay on top of their vaccine schedule. So as we're moving through summer and preparing for school, always back to school vaccine is a part of getting ready, just like buying your school supplies, getting your backpacks. And so it's really important to think about COVID as a part of that getting ready for school. Is APH already planning for COVID-19 boosters? I'll jump in on that one as well. Um, we are anticipating that a booster vaccine uh, will be something that we uh, may have to roll out in the fall. Note, boosters have not been recommended yet. Um, and really, um, at the looking at the data, the, all of the clinical trials, they're studying to see how well the vaccine has is working right now. And currently, we know the vaccine we have um, available in the United States is very, very strong for um, for um, reducing COVID-19 disease and reducing uh, death and actually eliminating deaths uh, for those who are vaccinated. So that's very important. Um, and they look to see how long um, the vaccine uh, is effective after we've gotten the after vac initial vaccination. And so that study is really important to make sure that um, we are protected on an ongoing basis. We also know that the vaccine uh, manufacturing is looking at if a booster becomes something that we need, that the next booster incorporates the variants that are circulate, circulating around the world. And so we anticipate that the booster uh, will incorporate a, maybe a different uh, vaccine and not the vaccine we currently have. Uh, so that's another thing we're considering is what would that look like? Um, so we are looking at all of those different things. Uh, noting we have stood down our mass vaccine uh, components right now, but we are planning if we need to stand up another type of large mass vaccine um, setting, we are preparing to do that in the fall. And this is a part of how we plan for vaccines every year. We anticipate boosters will hit at the same time that flu hits. Um, and we always do mass flu clinics in the fall. So we anticipate we would do very similar activities, just potentially on a larger scale. Um, and we've tested that quite a bit this, uh, this spring as we were launching COVID vaccine. So we feel uh, confident and ready and we have the resources ready to deploy so we can meet that community need should it come up. As mask and distancing disciplines are likely abandoned, is a more typical flu season anticipated this fall? Um, I'll, I'll try to answer that. Um, you know, flu season each year, is uh, quite how it, it's hard to predict sometimes. Um, we do monitor what kind of strains were uh, circulating in the Southern Hemisphere uh, as they begin to prepare vaccine and plan for the, the, the upcoming flu season. However, because of COVID and I think because of prevention measures such as masking uh, and social distancing, uh, the flu season was relatively light, so it may be a, a hard, hard to predict uh, what our upcoming flu season might look like. Um, so, you know, we always encourage people to get vaccinated for flu when that vaccine becomes available. It, you know, the quadrivalent strain has four different strains that are available in it, uh, two flu A and two flu B strains. Um, but again, those strains that they select are, are, are based on what the epidemiology shows uh, happening uh, throughout the United States the year before or whatever, uh, or through uh, the Southern Hemisphere and other countries. So it's going to be hard to predict what this flu season will look like, but 
You can always reduce your risk to flu by wearing your mask, washing your hands, um, getting your flu vaccine, and staying home if you're sick, and social distancing. With this being the last media Q&A and with cases and hospitalizations significantly declining, what grade would, would you give APH and how it dealt over the past year with the pandemic? I'll, I'll start. That, that's a, a difficult question to answer because there are a lot of factors to to be considered. Um, I would give us a B only because I think the the effort was A. I think the willingness to respond to challenges were an A. Um, I think um, we had some resource and technology gaps that affected our ability our, our efforts to match our intentions and our, our, our drive. Um, and I say B because we still learned a lot. I think COVID was a very harsh reminder of um, the inequities that we have in certain communities with respect to quality of life outcomes, with respect to health care, with respect to health care access. And um, I say B because I want us to be even better. Like I want us to, to think beyond COVID. How do we as a city, as a county, as a health department, how do we plan to address those um, systemic inequities more effectively so that the next pandemic um, we are better prepared? So be to leave room to to learn but my APH team is full of all stars and I thank them every day for their intense commitment and professionalism and I'll just add you know one of the challenges I think uh, as Adrian mentioned in our response uh, was that you know we I think what this response throughout the country has highlighted is that public health infrastructure and support for public health. Um, a lot of people don't see what public health is. They were behind the scenes. I always say we are the invisible guardians of the community. You don't know that we're operating unless something hay haywire happens like a disease pandemic of this magnitude. And we're here, we have had a very dedicated, passionate group of people who are on the cusps of burnout because they have worked day in and day not day out to protect this community. Um, public health is not primary care. We do not provide primary care services to the indigent population. We are here to protect the entire community and visitors to our community. So, you know, uh, one of the struggles we had as as we have said, and I've said this to a number of people, we were, you know, using technology that was 19th century technology. We were using paper and pencil when we should have been using sophisticated things and, and we were building an airplane as we flew it. And so I feel like, you know, we did great. And this response was so massive that there's so many different components to it that you may see a mass vaccination clinic, or you may see an epi response, but you don't see all the underlying uh, machine pieces that are working uh, behind the scenes. And so, yes, yeah, definitely A for effort for our group. Uh, we have a lot of hardworking people in this community that have dedicated themselves over the last year in protecting, in protecting Austin and Travis County. And I would just, want to also kind of share the success of the pandemic and how we've been able to respond uh, rapidly. Of course, we had bumps and bruises along the way as we were trying to mobilize and build, as Janet said, the plane as we flew it. Um, those things that had to be developed and put in place did not exist prior to COVID. Um, and then also just trying to track and watch this brand new disease. Um, but I'd be remiss 
if I didn't commend the tremendous work that the department did, but also the tremendous work that our partners um, collab in collaboration with Austin Public Health. Um, we may have been uh, the public health department leading this effort, but this success and, and the ability for us to rapidly respond um, is greatly in part to all of the collaborative work across the um, hospital systems, across the um, other medical providers, across the community. The school district, Austin ISD, donated tremendous amount of space for us to stand up mass clinics. Um, and, and all of the community partners just coming together and saying, we're going to tackle this and we're going to do this together. And so that really speaks so much about us as a community. Um, yes, we had spikes in disease, but then we were immediately ready to tackle it. And yes, we had struggles trying to make sure that the masking was stayed in place, but we worked through those kinks and we made it work so that we protected our community as much as possible. So as a whole, this was a community effort um, beyond just Austin Public Health that we were, I think, when you determine success, the fact that we, we, of course, we've lost some folks along the way. We've had people die, but we've actually had um, great work in really flattening the curve as quickly as those spikes happen. We would, we would work, get to work and flatten the curve as quickly as possible. So it's, it's, it's been um, all of us coming together and, and making it happen. This is the second to last question, so I am going to jump in on this. What still needs to change so that you're not forced to build an airplane as you fly if another pandemic occurs? I'd like to start off um, by saying that that's a good question because we're not, the pandemic's not over. We're still, we're still in this to win it, um, and we're still working to own our machine, um, make sure our systems that we've been using that are successful remain in place um, and be ready for um, what's, what is going to come. Um, the, the collaboration that uh, Cassie talked about has been really key um, to our success. Um, communication between um, the parties involved at all levels of um, public health and medical providers and hospitals and nursing homes and schools and, and neighbors. Um, all of that is why we are where we are today and that must continue and, and, and fostered as we go forward even after we get to a point where we say the pandemic's over. Those collaborations must be contained, maintained because they really are the key to the success of what's happened here. I would agree with that, Dr. Walks, but I, I also think that the current administration has um, set the tone for that. The American Relief Package includes specific language about support for public health infrastructure um, and support for the public health workforce. And so that national investment will trickle down to um, local mun municipalities. And um, I'm hopeful that here in our community, we will be able to put those dollars to good use. Specifically in terms of infrastructure though, like I know how a lot of the data was being inputted in the beginning was antiquated, things like that. Um, <laughs> Are we up to speed? Um, have those systems been modernized or do, do we still have a ways to go? Um, I'll answer that. Um, as far as like, there's some things that are not modernized. Obviously, we still receive multiple laboratory reports via fax machine. Um, there's not a electron. I mean, there are ways to receive it electronically. I think that's improved over time. Um, you know, uh, but there are still some providers who who are required by law to report to local public health diseases of notifiable conditions, whether it be rabies, COVID, um, and those types of things, and we follow up with them. But we still they they still rely heavily on fax machines to get that information to us. However, we have made huge improvements as far as like 
working with providers to get line listings and data feeds uh, into our system. Uh, the system that we are currently using, which is on a Salesforce platform, is tied to our testing, uh, you know, so that once we get tests, it, we can begin doing the case investigation and contact tracing. So the system that we have in place um, is uh, currently operating very effectively and uh, we're able to, you know, pull information out. It's what feeds our dashboard on a daily basis. If you uh, see any of our dashboards that are on our uh, COVID webpage, uh, many of those are fed from the data feeds that uh, we uh, analyze on a daily basis. Um, so I do think there have been vast improvements. Uh, and, you know, there are things like uh, direct data feeds back to the state to improve data reporting and timely reporting into the state as well. Although there's always areas for improvement that I think can continue. And I'm hoping as uh, uh, Adrian mentioned that the American Relief Package and funding that goes to the CDC and to local governments and local health departments uh, continues to focus on those efforts of improving uh, you know, disease uh, reporting and uh, allows us to improve our epi investigation in a timely way because uh, I think that will help uh, control any type of epidemic or outbreak that we may have in the future. And, uh, and I just want to add, um, you know, locally, there's definitely things that we um, see in our infrastructure that um, can improve the public health system. Uh, again, not just from Austin Public Health, but also from all of the providers that feed into the system. But something else to think about is we're a part of a larger statewide public health system and national public health system. And so there's infrastructure gaps that are all along that continuum. And um, this is a real opportunity, as Janet said, public health is there always, um, but the systems haven't been fortified to the level that um, when a pandemic like this hits, um, there are some gaps and this uh, was an important um, opportunity for us to identify where those gaps are at all of those different levels of the public health system. And I think important work is ahead of us to uh, reflect on how we can improve and reflect on how we would move forward um, and uh, take those uh, lessons learned into our ongoing programming and our ongoing um, decision making at all of those levels, local, state and national. This is the last question with mass events returning to our area. What are your recommendations? And then I'd just like to tack on only about 53% of Travis County residents over the age of 12 are fully vaccinated. But if you look around, things look pretty much as they did pre pandemic. So what concerns do you have, if any, about these mass events? Uh, I'll start with that. Um, we are ready, willing, and able to work with event planners and businesses that are planning events. Um, we understand that that's a vital part of the Austin economy, um, and we are, our team is ready to help with planning, um, look at best practices so that we can do these things in a safe manner. Um, encouraging masking um, where necessary, um, looking at um, outdoor versus indoor with outdoor being a lot more of a, a, a safer environment for these things to occur. So um, the APH team is ready to um, work and meet with those individuals and, and organizations that are, are looking at doing events. And I'll also just add that um, Part of the epidemiologic response here at Austin Public Health is uh, situ what we call situational awareness. Uh, we are monitoring at all times circulations of any type of disease, whether it be Ebola, loss of fever, uh, COVID-19, the variants of COVID-19 that are circulating throughout the world. And the reason why is, you know, if you anybody saw the news this morning, and saw how crowded the Austin airport was, disease is only an airplane ride away. 
it doesn't matter where you are, if you're in Europe, if you're in, in Asia, um, it, you could be anywhere and it's just a, a airplane right away. And so uh, we work very closely with the Centers for Disease Control uh, uh, Division of Global Migration and Quarantine Office that's based out of Houston uh, to follow and monitor travelers who may return into the Austin area or who uh, depart in Austin. Uh, to be part of the events and festivities that occur in Central Texas. So um, there are times when they ask us to maintain and monitor those individuals, and we will continue to do that at their direction. But we are also, you know, uh, very interested in monitoring some of these events to, to see if uh, people who are bringing illness in um, uh, you know, that's part of our, our screening and workup should someone present to a hospital or whatnot. So, so, you know, we are doing that disease surveillance, that situational awareness to make sure that we have awareness at all time of what kind of diseases are circulating throughout the, the world and the United States. That is it for our questions, and I am sorry about my barking dog. Um, thank you. Thank you very much to Fox 7 for uh, being our poll reporter for uh, our final uh, media Q&A event. And with that, I will go uh, back around leadership and see if you have any final comments on what you would like to uh, tell out to the community. And we'll start with Adrian. Thank you, Matt. Um, my message is the same. No matter what's going on around you, you as a citizen have the power to make the choice that's best for you and my family. Real quick story. My son is 14, first day of camp yesterday. He's got his mask on because he already knows. He walks in, he doesn't see any kids with masks on, and he asks the counselor, are masks required here? And the counselor says, well, it's your choice. And he looks around. And he says to me, mom, I'm going to take this off and put it in my pocket because I know we're going to be outside all day. I have my hand sanitizer. And if I feel unsafe, I'm going to put my mask back on. And in the five minutes that I had to make the drop off, I was like, okay, we'll talk more about it when we get home. My point, the point of that story is you can use information that's readily available to make the choice that best fits you, suits you, and meet your comfort level. And so I encourage you to continue to mask, continue, continue to distance, continue to wash your hands when you have access to soap and water, and if not, keep your little hand sanitizer with you. If a 14-year-old teen boy can get that down, I'm confident that as a community, we can all adopt those same decision-making strategies to do what's best for ourselves and our neighbors. Thank you. I am, I just want to say once again that I am humbled by the confidence and pleased to be here. Um, that uh, I'm just really excited to be part of the APH team. Um, the pandemic's not over, so please, please, please do the social distancing, hand washing, and mask when appropriate. But please if you know somebody who's sitting on the fence needs a little information about being vaccinated encourage them to get the vaccine we want to get to 70 percent i'd love to sit outside on july 4th with the friends and neighbors and watch those fireworks uh, just like we all would and um it'd be really nice to listen to music again um so let's do it austin Yes, well, thanks everyone for uh, all the hard work and efforts to get us where we are over the last year. We've made some huge, we've, we've uh, jumped some huge hurdles as far as uh, the first and second wave goes about implementation of vaccine operations. But it is, as Dr. Wax and Adrian have both mentioned, we, we're not, this is, we're not over. This is not over yet. Uh, I'd like for it to be over. Trust me, we've been working many, many long hours 
and uh, we would like to see our families uh, <laughs> more frequently. But, um, you know, and I won't belabor the point of prevention measures, although they say if you hear it more than once or three times, it sinks in. So uh, wash your hands, avoid touching your face, wear your mask, uh, social distance, and stay home if you're sick. Uh, and with that, I'll add one other uh, prevention message, and that's for mosquito season, and that is to make sure that you uh, avoid being outside at dusk and dawn uh, when mosquitoes are biting, wear a DEET or other related products, uh, make sure you're dressed appropriate, appropriately to avoid mosquito bites, and drain any standing waters uh, to reduce an environment for mosquito breeding. And with that, I'll turn it over to Cassia Leon. Thank you, Janet. I just wanna share a few statistics um, for the community to consider as we move into the weekend and you are making the decision whether or not to get the vaccine if you haven't yet, or you have the opportunity to encourage someone to get the vaccine. We have a national goal to get all adults um, vaccinated and the effort to try to get up to 70% of all adults vaccinated by July 4th. So we right now in Travis County are sitting at almost 66% of all adults vaccinated with their first dose. And that's what that goal is. It's by July 4th, all adults, 70% get that first dose. So 70% first dose by July 4th, we're almost there. We just really wanna encourage the rest of our community that may be on the fence, they're not there yet, but we wanna get them vaccinated to take the opportunity this weekend to find a provider that suits them. Uh, there's lots of choices for vaccine and it's, it's free, it's available in a lot of different locations. So I want to encourage everyone to get vaccinated. We already know that um, over 730,000 individuals in Travis County have gotten their first dose. That's more than half of our population. We're getting there, but we still have more work to do and the community can make it happen. So we really want to encourage everyone to get out, get vaccinated so that we can attain that 70% of all of our eligible population get have their first dose vaccine by July 4th. With that, I am excited to wish you a happy and uh, fun weekend and just enjoy uh, the summer. Thank you, Austin. Thanks, Cassie. And this concludes our uh, final media Q&A. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Interim Director Surup, Cassie DeLeon, Dr. Wax, and Janet Pichette for joining us this morning. And with that, everyone have a great and safe weekend. Will Dupree here again in the KXAN live studio. Thank you all for sticking with us as we brought you this very last Q&A that Austin Public Health is holding related to COVID-19. Um, reaching this point, it is very hard to believe after everything that we have gone through over the last uh, year and a few months. Um, it's a lot to take in at the moment, but what they are saying is an encouraging number there shared at the end by Cassie De Leon is that 66% uh, of the adults who are eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccine have gotten at least one dose at this point. That is a huge accomplishment for our area. Again, 66% of the eligible adults who have gotten that, um, they are again encouraging people to get the shot if they have not done so already. They're also asking parents um, who have children that are 12 and older to consider getting vaccinated as well. Pfizer has that available after receiving emergency use authorization for those 12 and older. So they're again encouraging that. Uh, but there are a lot of topics to discuss related to this. Um, they talked about the challenges they have gone through and we have seen a lot of those uh, firsthand as we've continued to cover it. Um, discussing the uh, obstacles with infrastructure and technology and how those have improved in uh, many ways as well. Uh, they're saying for people out there that, you know, if you have had COVID-19 and think the antibodies alone are enough to protect you. Uh, Dr. Desmar Walks, who is the new health authority um, for Austin Travis County, 
She says you still need to get the COVID-19 vaccine because it, because it is more protective and longer lasting than those antibodies from the infection alone. Those were her remarks at the very beginning of the briefing today. Uh, they also said that the positivity rate in our community is just at about 2.2% percent incredibly low. The seven day average for hospitalizations related to COVID-19 is just about 12. However, this pandemic is not over just yet. If you take a look right here at these numbers we shared at the very beginning of our stream, there are still about almost 300 active cases at the moment. But take a look on that right hand column. 78 people are currently hospitalized battling COVID-19. 32 are in intensive care and 17 are requiring ventilators to help them breathe. Uh, these people are still dealing with this. Um, this is why the officials we just heard from are still pushing for people to keep up those protective measures like masking and social distancing and washing your hands um, and staying home if you're sick. It's also why they're pushing um, and asking people to get vaccinated if they can because it is available readily all across the community. More information about uh, where to find vaccination locations if you are so interested and have not done so already, that's available on our website, kxan.com. You can also find it on the KXAN News app. Please download that. If you've not done so already, we would appreciate it. Much information is there available at your fingertips. Uh, once again, I'm Will Dupree here in the KXAN Live studio. Thank you all for sticking around and trusting us to share this information about COVID-19 as we have all dealt with this pandemic for more than a year now. It is not over. Please stay safe out there, everybody, and take care. We'll see you back here at another time.